Hello and welcome back to The History Freak. On today's video, we'll be talking about the legendary Margaret Beaufort. Before we start, why not like this video, subscribe to this channel, and turn on those notifications, and you won't miss any of our fabulous content. Okay, time to learn about Margaret. Before we get to Margaret, sometimes described as the mother of the Tudors, let's do some speedy history on her family background. Get ready to hear about far more people called John than you ever wished to. King Edward III had a son, John, known as John of Gaunt. John had a mistress, Catherine Swinford. They had four children, one of which was John Beaufort. John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford were married in 1396, and their children were made legitimate. John Beaufort had a son of his own, also called John Beaufort. And with his wife, Margaret Beauchamp, he had a single child, the star of our video, Margaret Beaufort, probably born in 1443. John died, possibly by hanging himself, when Margaret was only a young girl. With the death of her father, Margaret was set to inherit his fortune. Money was never a problem for Margaret. She was wealthy her whole life, which certainly helped in her missions. Margaret was described as being intelligent, bold and proud. She was very aware of her links to royalty, and she certainly showed a lot of courage and determination in her life. She was a formidable woman who pulled off what may have seemed the impossible. She was probably not as serious as she is sometimes portrayed. She enjoyed gambling, hunting and spending money on fine clothes and jewels. Margaret was married four times in her life, although it seems she herself didn't actually consider the first one a real marriage. Like many highborn girls, she was married for politically strategic reasons and not for love. Her first husband was John de la Pole. The two were still very young children when they were married and still young when the marriage was annulled. Margaret would have been around 11 years old at the end of this relationship. Two years later, in 1455, she married her second husband, Edmund Tudor, the Earl of Richmond. Edmund, through his mother, was half-brother to the king of the time, Henry VI. Margaret was just 12 when she married Edmund, who was around 25. It seems the expectation of marriages with children so young were that they could be consummated to make it valid, but then the idea is to let the child develop before attempting to begin the process of making babies. Unfortunately for Margaret, who as well as being young was also said to be very small for her age, had a husband who didn't feel like waiting for his wife to be physically ready. This is clear as Margaret became pregnant early 1456. Edmund actually died, probably of the plague, before the child was born, and Margaret was now a widow and soon to be mother. After a difficult labour, the 13-year-old Margaret gave birth to her son, Henry, in January 1457. And of course, he would go on in time to become King Henry VII, the first Tudor king. Despite being married two more times, Margaret never had any more children in her life. The standard at the time with children dying young seemed to be, pop as many out as you can but Margaret may have been left physically unable after being so young when she gave birth. Or it may have been a choice to have no more children. Going through something so traumatic at such a young age must have been very tough. The still young Margaret needed another husband. Someone who could help her 
and her son Henry, and she married Henry Stafford in 1458. Stafford, it seems, was at least 15 years older than Margaret. The two seem to have had a fairly happy marriage. They were together about 13 years before Stafford's death. They frequently visited Margaret's son Henry, who was being brought up by his uncle, Jasper Tudor. One of the reasons Margaret is famous is because she was an important individual in the War of the Roses. Over 30 years, this violent civil war between the houses of York and Lancaster went back and forth and affected all people living in England. The complexities of the War of the Roses are not something I can explain quickly in this video. There are many important people and battles, so I would definitely recommend people read up on it. It was a fascinating time in English history. Margaret, due to her family's connection to the crown, was a strong supporter of Lancaster and the King Henry VI. It was certainly within her interest to see Lancaster stay in power. The power shifted over the years, and Henry would be removed from the throne and Edward IV, from the York side, became king. Margaret's son was a threat to Edward, so Edward took away Henry's titles and lands, much to the fury of Margaret. Over the years, Margaret stayed as close as she could to her son and always worked for his future. Part of how she did this was to play nice and build a relationship with King Edward and his queen, the commoner, Elizabeth Woodville. When in time Henry VI got his throne back, Margaret was of course thrilled. She brought her son Henry to meet the king and Margaret was very happy when King Henry supposedly made a prediction that her son would end the war and heal England. In a move that possibly caused some tension between them, Margaret's husband Stafford shifted his support from Lancaster to York in the wars. It wasn't totally unusual for people to switch allegiance, as everyone wanted to be on the winning side. But Margaret felt so strongly for Lancaster, it's hard to imagine she would be thrilled about this. After a battle at Barnet, Edward came out on top once again, and he was back on the throne. It may not have been such a good mood for Stafford, as although he was on the winning side, he actually died from his battle injuries, leaving Margaret a widow again. Once back on the throne, the old King Henry was imprisoned and then died. Many believed, due to the threat he was to Edward, he was actually murdered. Jasper and Henry Tudor, with the encouragement from Margaret, fled to France. At this point, it would not have been certain when or if she would see them again. Margaret's fourth and final husband was nobleman Thomas Stanley, who she married in 1472. This was a great strategic match for Margaret, as Stanley had done a really good job staying on good terms with different kings from the war. His diplomacy meant that Margaret could be at court and in a good position under the reign of Edward, thus putting her close to power and able to look for opportunities to improve her son's position. Margaret seemed to have had a reasonably good relationship with Queen Elizabeth. Margaret was made godmother to one of Elizabeth's children. I'm not sure they would be considered friends, but there did seem to be a level of trust between them as they plotted together at times. It's said that Edward suggested Margaret's son Henry as a possible husband for his eldest daughter Elizabeth, meaning he would be able to come home. But in 1483, Edward died, and his young son Edward should have become the new king. But he along with his brother were the princes in the tower, who went missing and were in time presumed by many murdered by their uncle, who now became King Richard III. Some have suggested that Margaret herself may have been involved in the death of the two princes, so as to make way for her son Henry. Some of these accusations came after her death, 
and I don't think media portrayals of Margaret always help her. She is often shown quite harshly and as being ruthlessly calculating. There could be some truth to the accusation, although I think it's unlikely. Margaret always wanted her son to be king, but it seems it's at this time that she really starts to see a realistic path to the throne for him. She started getting involved with amazingly brave plots with former Queen Elizabeth Woodville to overthrow Richard and replace him as king with her son Henry and have Elizabeth Woodville's daughter marry him and become queen, thus bringing both sides together through marriage and giving both women a win. If you think Margaret is one of the most determined people in history, then Elizabeth Woodville would give her a run for her money. Despite losing so many loved ones during the wars, and now with the death of her sons, she never relents in her ambition. Fueled by her hatred for King Richard, the man sitting on the throne where her son should be, she would it seems risk anything to take him down. The Buckingham Rebellion of 1483 was a plan to remove Richard from the throne by force. Margaret was heavily involved in the plan, but it failed. Margaret could well have lost her life for being a part of this, but possibly due to her husband's good relationship with the king, she got away with being under house arrest. She was also punished by losing some of her lands. In 1485, Henry landed in Wales with his army. With financial help from Margaret, Henry was able to gather support. Richard got his army together, and the famous Battle of Bosworth Field took place. Margaret's son Henry won the day, with the support of his father-in-law Stanley, who had strategically waited to decide which side he would support. Somehow, all Margaret's years of plans had worked out. It must have been the greatest moment of her life. Her son was now king. For her part in his success, Henry was always grateful to his mother. They seem to have a very close relationship, which is surprising in some ways as they spent so little time together over the years. Her relationship with her husband Stanley was an interesting one. While they remained married and somewhat close after her son became king, Margaret made it clear she didn't feel she needed a husband. She took a vow of chastity and was busy involving herself in her son's business, as well as being a champion for education, setting up schools and colleges. Stanley died in 1504, leaving her a widow again. The possibility of her marrying again would have been out of the question. Margaret acted very proudly as Queen Mother, and in fact she acted like the Queen herself. She wanted all to know and see her high status. Henry did nothing to stop this, as he owed her so much, and the good-natured Queen Elizabeth of York didn't seem to be overly bothered by it, instead choosing to focus her energies on her children, although it's probably fair to say she was annoyed at times by her mother-in-law. Elizabeth Woodville was banished from court and goes to live in an abbey when Henry was king, and some have suggested Margaret may have encouraged this decision. Possibly it's true, as Margaret may have not wanted a rival to her position. Margaret also involved herself in the lives of her grandchildren. She felt strongly that her granddaughter, the Princess Margaret, who was to be married very young, should not suffer the way she had by potentially getting pregnant while not developed properly. When her eldest grandson, the heir to the throne, Arthur, died as a teenager, Margaret must have been devastated. But she put her energies into the new heir, Henry, who would go on to become the legendary Henry VIII. Sadly, Margaret lived long enough to see the death of her only son. She actually lived about two months more after his death. But in June 1509, in her mid-60s, Margaret died. She was buried in Westminster Abbey, along with a heap of other English royals. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this video about Margaret. If you did, why not like this video and subscribe to our channel? And check out some of our other videos about fascinating women that lived in the Tudor times. And keep an eye out for our upcoming video when we'll be talking about some of the pretenders to Henry VII's crown, Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck.